Hi. In the rise of Adventism, Edwin Scott Gaustad, editor. This is a chapter by Lawrence Moore of Cornell University on spiritualism and its great advance in popularity in the middle of the 19th century. In view of these divisions, one must be careful with generalizations. On only a single ground is there room to make a blanket assertion about the religious tendencies of those men and women whose belief in communicating spirits became an important part of their religious stance. Most of them, in the mid and late 19th century, shared an aversion to what they called Christian orthodoxy, meaning, as a minimum, a belief in the Trinity, human depravity, predestination, vicarious atonement, and a final judgment. They moved in the direction of theological liberalism. For this reason, among the early spiritualist pub publicists, there were proportionately few Presbyterians, Congregationalists, or Lutherans, and proportionately many Quakers, Unitarians, and Universalists. A number of Methodists became spiritualists, and virtually no Episcopalians, facts which, which suggest that relative social standing was also a factor in determining one's susceptibility to spiritualist religion. It was not just the depth to which one had sunk into Arminianism, Antinomianism, or Socinianism. S. B. Britton, R. P. Ambler, Uriah Clark, Aidan Ballou, John Murray Spear, William Fishbow, and J. M. Peebles had, had all been, all had been Universalist ministers, and most of them, because of the increased liberalizing force at work in spiritualism, came to consider even Universalism too dogmatic. Many spiritualist leaders broke with their churches. Others did not. Probably the greatest number of them had been unchurched already before the movement began. The abolitionist views of Laroy Sunderland, for example, had led him out of the Methodist Church in 1842, several years prior to his first experiences with spiritualist mediums. The people who worked to establish a separate spiritualist religion preserved a bias against formal churches and against formal creeds throughout the 19th century. There was nothing that could be called a national spiritualist church at any time in the 19th century. There was, briefly, in the 1850s, a society for the diffusion of spiritual knowledge. Horace H. Day, a manufacturer of rubber fabrics who lost a patent suit against Charles Goodyear, gave most of the money to support the organization. Other officers of the society, including Joseph Williams, a territorial judge in Iowa and Kansas, Warren Chase, an ex-member of the Wisconsin State Legislature, and Nath Nathaniel Talmadge, a former United States Senator and the ex-governor of the Wisconsin Territory. Clearly, spirit investigation was a matter too important for the clergy. Otherwise, the society would not have relied so exclusively on the leadership of judges, politicians, and businessmen. Aside from the society, in the 19th century many other local, state, and regional societies rose up and passed away. Spiritualists gathered at annual conventions and summer camps. They organized Lyceum Sunday schools, held weekly conferences, usually on Sundays, and from 1865 until 1873 tried to support a national spiritualist association. None of these organizations, despite their consistent agreement about the need to liberalize religious belief, amounted to much more than a debating society. The spiritualists, both in and out of other churches who came to the meetings, and one leader bored with such proceedings estimated that not more than one in ten spiritualists bothered to attend regularly, wanted to hear issues discussed. They did not normally try to settle points of dispute ignoring arguments that their future strength depended on finding some platform of unity, they always hesitated to pass resolutions that might be construed as dictating belief. Henry F. Gardner, one of the early promoters of the movement, declared, I do not believe the time has come for any general plan of organization to be set on foot. In fact, I do not believe that such a time will ever come in the history of our cause. We have had enough of organization in the past. I do not believe in crystallizing spiritualism with creeds. End of quote. 
so adverse to congregation, our spiritualists, another leader wrote in the late 1850s, that although numbering thousands in our own city, Boston, not more than one meeting can be supported here, and that not to any great extent, except upon particular occasions, end of quote. In 1893, when the National Spiritualist Association did come into permanent existence, a speaker surveying the fortunes of spiritualist organization or organizations in the 19th century said, with the exception of a half dozen societies, perhaps, there is not in America a single church, temple, or building devoted to education, social, ethical, or moral reform movements that belongs to spiritual societies today. End of quote. A dismal record, perhaps, given the suspected strength of spiritualist belief in the preceding decades, but relatively few spiritualists had ever wanted it any other way. They were serious about preserving the emphasis on individual and free inquiry and on private investigation. To qualify as a spiritualist, one had only to believe in the individual soul's survival after death and the ability of the dead to communicate with the living. According to a Declaration of Sentiments adopted at the Convention of Spiritualists in Plymouth, Massachusetts in 1859, quote, we recognize as spiritualists all who hold to the one fact that human spirits have a conscious personal existence after the death of their physical bodies and can and do manifest themselves and do communicate to those in the body under suitable conditions. Beyond this, on questions of philosophy, morals, theology, reform, etc., we profess no full agreement and take no responsibility for each other's opinions or acts. End of quote. There is a certain irony, of course, in the failure of spiritualists to reach a more certain and definite statement of principles. After all, spiritualism opened the floodgates of what was publicized as new revelation. Many spokesmen of the cause in the 1850s and later spoke of a new dispensation, a dispensation, according to some sources, made possible by the electrical inventions of Benjamin Franklin in the spirit world. In the first decades of the spirit communications, there poured from the presses volume upon thick volume of messages purporting to come from leading sages of all ages. Significantly, the bulk of these messages emanated from people who in this life had followed secular roles, especially from the founding fathers of the United States, rather than from people who had been religious leaders. Supporters praised these messages as original and beautiful, and some spiritualists took individual volumes as significant disclosures of religious truth. None of the spirit books, however, not even those based on the endless series of inspired messages flowing through Andrew Jackson Davis, managed to establish itself as a holy scripture sufficient to launch a unified church. There is no equivalent in spiritualist literature to the Book of Mormon. The communicating spirits, it turned out, disagreed Spiritualism, unlike some relig American religious movements of the mid-19th century based upon new revelation, democratized the channels of spirit communication and left itself with no choice but ecumenical tolerance. When anyone could get a spirit message, and when almost anyone could become a medium, there was little chance of getting standard version of a sacred text. Spiritualists had a way of making a virtue out of what their critics cited as a defect. They quite regularly confessed with no sense of embarrassment to the many contradictions in the spirit messages. The earthly writings of Isaac Newton and George Washington were in most cases preferable to their spiritual utterances. In content, messages could be wrong or misleading or garbled in transmission, or they could contain demonstrably bad advice given by a spirit of low intellect or of low morality. Judge John Edmonds, a justice of the New York Supreme Court, who embraced spiritualism in the early 1850s and himself became a source of spirit messages, welcomed these imperfect revelations. A perfect revelation, he argued, would leave the human mind with nothing further to do. It would, he said, come with, it would come to with authority and we should be required to render obedience and not judgment. Writing at the end of the century, T. E. Allen, a Unitarian clergyman who edited the Psychical Review, also found virtue 
in the uncertainty of the messages. Since revelation can be true or false, he asserted, reason must arbitrate. By such logic, spiritualists released their brand of revelation from divine fiat and made spirit communication into a puzzle decipherable only by the application of human ingenu ingenuity. According to Epus Sargent, an American writer who in the post-Civil War years published some of the most popular books about spiritualist phenomena, quote, no inspired communication is authoritative any further than it expresses truth to the individual consciousness, which is always the final standard of judgment. The communicating spirits, in fact, almost always disclaimed intimate knowledge of divine intentions. The spirits of mortal men made no pretense, just because they were dead, of having achieved perfect knowledge. They were not channels of divine revelation and conveyed no final word on any moral or theological question. People who received the messages were often in the comforting position of knowing more than the spirits. The instruction between spirits and mortals was a two-way street because many in the spirit world are even below our level, both intellectually and morally. The report of Dr. Charles Main, a healing medium of his own lectures to spirits, his spirit pupils numbered in the hundreds of thousands, offers no little insight into the psychology of many who got involved in the movement. By far the most important kind of spirit message delivered at seances came not from great personages of history who professed to speak with vastly higher knowledge than the, that of those still bound by their earthly bodies, but from the deceased friends and relatives of the sitters. The content of those messages was inconsequential, except insofar as it contained a detail of personal nature which the sitter could ascribe only to a spirit source and not to a prior knowledge of the medium or any telepathic powers. Many of the most eagerly witnessed manifestations at seances had nothing to do with messages at all. The so-called physical manifestations, tables lifted in the air, tambourines played by unseen presences, sitters touched by invisible hands, made the spirits tangible, and that was enough. American spiritualists, in general, echoed the thought of Elizabeth Barrett Browning, who became a proponent of the reality of spirit voices when the raid spread to England. She said, as to the spirits, I care less about what they are capable of communicating than of the fact of their being communications. I certainly wouldn't set about building a system of theology out of their oracles. God forbid, end of quote. Marshall McLuhan should have written about 19th century spiritualists. For them, the medium was the message. I'll put in a link to Johannes Graeber and Jehovah's Witnesses. How is it that a spiritualist holds some of the same positions on theology as so-called God's organization? <laughs>